and then we will discuss any um, other initiatives or so that uh, Ministry of Health has embarked on as it relates to COVID-19. Um, I know that we, you know, many of us are looking forward to a day when we will sit here and, and speak about um, other matters, uh, but this um, health security matter continues to um, dominate our attention. So we'll try to keep you up to date as to the latest that is um, happening with this disease. So uh, yesterday, we identified another um, 239 cases from uh, just over 1,600 tests. That brought our active count up to 3,346. Um, With regards to positivity rate, uh, yesterday positivity was just around 21% um, to, um, to my memory. But what should be observed is that since the peak, or what we interpret to be a peak of the infection a week ago, or just, just over a week ago, where we identified, uh, I think, 501 cases in, that, on, on, in a single day with a positivity rate of 28%. What we have observed since is a steady decline in the positivity rate of cases. Um, while this is encouraging, we cannot uh, lose sight of the fact that we are still in the midst of an, 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 uh, a particularly intense outbreak of Omicron, and we all need to do a part to ensure that uh, this disease uh, goes away, all right? We only need to do our part to ensure that, you know, we limit the number of cases and any possible untoward effect as much as possible. With regards to deaths, um, so far, uh, we have reported 204 and four of those were recorded uh, this year. Uh, compared to our previous outbreak, um, these figures are minimal, all right, um, when you look at the number of cases that are being recorded. But this has been the picture with this um, variant. Uh, although there's large number of cases, the number of deaths and hospitalizations um, so far has, has, been, has been relatively low. With regards to deaths, now, uh, generally, uh, each year, um, we summarize all deaths by the end of the first quarter for the entire previous year. So um, we are going to embark on a similar, on a similar exercise for the year 2021. We know that um, the Delta outbreak was intense and we want to ensure that all our deaths are counted. So once all of our certificates are in, uh, uh, the, the, the total of the deaths uh, may change, may increase or so, or otherwise. So that is, um, that is an exercise that we do each year. Uh, with regards to vaccination, I, you know, I wish I had better news <laughs> with, with, as it relates to, to vaccination. So far, we seem to have stalled on 32% full vaccination in the population. Um, just over 36,400 persons are fully vaccinated and just over 5% partially, and with boosters, 3.9% of the population so far have accepted uh, boosters. Now, the vaccination numbers are concerning to us because uh, basically they, uh, we, have, we are seeing a very, very, very slow uptake of vaccines. 
so far for this year we have delivered 3,182 doses but of this first doses are 671 second doses 575 and boosters 1,935 what does this mean? it means that relatively few persons all right, are coming forward to get their first and second um, doses of, of vaccine. And the persons who are, who are convinced of the benefits of vaccination, these are the ones that are taking the opportunity to ensure that they stay protected. Uh, this, is a, this is a figure that we would, this is something that we would love to see improve because the benefits of vaccination have been demonstrated. For an example, yesterday, because what we have noticed, noted for the month of January so far is a steady decline on a daily basis in the number of persons coming forward. And yesterday, imagine only 29 persons received their first dose, 26 their second dose. All right, so this is, this is something that we need to improve. Like I said, the benefits of vaccinations have been demonstrated um, throughout the world. With regard to testing, to date we have done 117,151 tests. Now, testing has been one of the areas where we have made um, tremendous strides. And for comparison, in the entire month of December, we did 7,301 tests. So far in January only, we have done 22,224 tests. All right, this is an, a, a more than 300% increase in testing. So while we have persons that are uh, they, are, they would like to know, they are interested in knowing their status. Uh, on the other hand, we are seeing that uh, many are not taking the opportunity to protect themselves by getting, by getting vaccinated. And we would like to see, we would like to see uh, this improve. Now, this increase in testing, of course, is, uh, uh, as I have mentioned before, it is putting um, some degree of strain on our, our, health, our health system. Our healthcare workers are doing uh, in excess of 1,000 plus. And I think um, Monday of this week, we did over 2,000 tests in a day, all right? So it is a challenge on our, uh, you know, our health workforce we must um, do all of these tests on a daily basis. And it is also uh, consuming a huge amount of resources uh, on a daily basis. Now, yesterday, all right, now one of the, the Ministry of Health has, has, has deployed many, many strategies to, to combat uh, COVID and its response to COVID. Um, one of which was that we upscaled our testing at our ports of entry. All right, we have done testing literally since uh, testing be um, became available to us in Grenada. We've done testing at ports of entry, and in response to outbreaks, we increase and. When um, things change, we would decrease. So in response to this latest outbreak, all right, when it was first identified um, in Africa at the end of November, we upscaled our testing, all right, because our aim was to quickly detect cases, all right, who could be, who could potentially be this variant and to delay as much as possible the introduction of this new variant into, into Grenada. However, 
right? This virus is, it's, it's a very tenacious one, all right? Despite our efforts, it has made its way into the country and it is spreading in our communities from person to person. All right, this is a similar scenario that occurred with the Delta virus. All right, so the disease is spreading locally, person to person. And it is becoming, um, it, it is more effective or efficient to fight the disease where it's occurring, which is in our communities, uh, going from person to person. Now, we have been doing testing at ports of entry. We've done in excess of 6,600 PCR and many more antigen tests. And we have detected far less than 1% of positive cases entering the country. So when you work that out, we are deploying a tremendous amount of resources, uh, testing at, at, at our ports of entry. And there is very little detection of disease. Now we believe that it is, it is wise for us to use those resources where they are needed most. And since the disease is spreading actively in our community, we need to prioritize. So we have taken the decision to discontinue the routine testing that we do for persons after they arrive um, at the airport. The, the, the persons who are going in quarantine, the um, individuals who are unvaccinated, um, they will be quarantined as normal and they will have their test at their quarantine sites at, on, uh, on day five. Um, of course, uh, health screening continues, health screening continues, and uh, if someone, if, if someone is screened and the public health officer at ports of entry um, suspects for any reason that that person may be infected uh, or potentially be, be, um, be, be carrying a disease, that person will be subjected to test. So the testing now becomes targeted and not a blanket, um, a, a blanket test for, for everyone. And of course, all the other entry requirements remain. All right, all the other entry requirements remain. So persons still need their PCR test within 72 hours to come into Grenada and, and so on and so forth. Now, the fact that we are detecting such low numbers of positive individuals entering the country means that that measure that we have is actually working, right? And it's actually um, limiting persons uh, who are positive from actually boarding a flight and traveling to Grenada. Now, as I finish, I just want to remind the public that avoiding COVID is a personal choice. Preventing yourself from becoming infected is a personal responsibility. If you wish to avoid infection, you need to adopt a lifestyle and, and behave in a manner that will prevent you from becoming infected. What should you do if you are worried about getting COVID and you do not want to be one of those individuals who get it. So how do you prevent yourself from, from getting infected? One, wear a mask and wear it correctly, covering the mouth and the nose. Persons who, are, are, who have symptoms, they should ensure that they cover their coughs and sneeze. Don't cough and sneeze into the air and expose everyone around you. All right, they should cover the cough and the sneeze either with the bend of the elbow or with a tissue and make sure that that tissue is discarded in a covered bin and wash or sanitize your hands um, afterwards. Avoid risky situations. 
avoid crowded close contact settings and especially settings where there is poor ventilation all right so if you do not need to go hang out in a closed up bar or any kind of closed up setting if you if you do not need to have that meeting in a closed air conditioned boardroom with with lots of individuals avoid it all right avoid um, all these things as best as practicable maintain physical distance all right maintain physical distance especially from persons who are symptomatic and of course get vaccinated because we know sometimes we can slip sometimes we live in in families where there are multiple individuals who work in different sites and go to different schools and go to different churches and all right so we don't all um, have the same uh, experiences during the day and when we come together all right when we come together sometimes we feel comfortable and we don't wear a mask and on all of these in this instance get vaccinated so that you are protected <clears throat> in the event that you become infected so basically this is my advice like i say it is a personal responsibility because we have to live with this virus for some time to come thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Sean Charles. We now go over to Dr. Taisha Donnell, Acting Director of Medical Services. Good morning. Good morning, and uh, thank you for having us here. Um, a special good morning to my colleague, Dr. Sean Charles, CMO, to the media, to everyone out there listening in Grenada, Karakou, and Piti Martinique. So a pleasant good morning to all. So I would give a report and a little update on what's happening at the level of hospital services. And at hospital services, um, uh, we, of course, we see similar trends as in comparison to what's happening in the community. So we've seen an uh, upsurge in terms of persons coming in with uh, the virus. And we've also seen an uptake in persons coming to our hospitals also for testing. Um, at the level of our hospitals, Princess Royal and Princess Alice, um, currently we have no cases admitted um, with COVID-19 at our hospital in uh, Mongue, Mongue Psychiatric Unit. We have a total of three patients isolated there who are there admitted principally for uh, mental illness and incidentally tested positive for COVID-19. They do not have any um, COVID pneumonia. Now at the level of our general hospital, we have a total of 12 admissions thus far. Uh, in terms of COVID related illness or COVID pneumonia, we have six patients. And of those six, we have one who is severely ill and the five remaining are moderately ill. And I know persons would want to know, of course, their vaccination status. Of that group of six, we have one person who is fully vaccinated, one person who is partially vaccinated, and the rest who are unvaccinated. The age range is between that of 46 to 84 years old. In terms of males, we have four and females, we have two. And of course, of these admissions, what we have noted is that all of these patients have underlying chronic illness. We have things ranging from cancer, from diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and of course, you know, the age, the age factor, which is also a risk. Uh, we have a, 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 another three patients who are maternity patients or pregnant women who again came in for pregnancy related issues and incidentally tested positive. And then the other three patients are patients who are chronically um, ill and incidentally uh, tested positive. So again, we've seen in our hospital setting that the number of patients that are admitted and of them, the majority of patients are unvaccinated and uh, the majority of patients are also patients within the high risk group. So patients who are above 60 years old and patients who have underlying illness. So chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and other conditions. So again, um, we'd like to implore. Uh, within hospital services, we also have a situation where our staff is also becoming ill with COVID-19. And of course, it has put a little strain on our system, but we're still staying afloat and standing strong. 
Um, so we just like support from the public, for example, in places like accident and emergency, just to bear with us a little, because though we have staff, we have a bit of a short staff situation, both with doctors, nurses, and with auxiliary staff. We want to implore also that persons coming into our accident and emergency, remember we're in the midst of a pandemic, we're in the midst of community spread, and of course we have a lot of persons right around us who may be positive. So we want to advise that persons come into the accident and emergency department, try to come with just one other person so that we could decrease the number of persons waiting around and who are potential risk to the persons who are waiting. So for accident and emergency, persons should come with at least just one person to accompany them because of course they're sick and they would need to have support. In terms of our visitation, Again, we just like a little support from the public in understanding that the thing about community spread, anyone can have COVID-19 and someone can come into the hospital and actually bring COVID-19 to our wards. And, and so we want to implore that the visitation be minimized. Persons should visit their loved ones. Of course, we have to provide psychological support to our loved ones, but let us try to minimize the visitation and of course the number of persons visiting a particular person. So we have again instituted um, the protocol whereby the next of kin is the person who is designated to, to visit and bring supplies and, su and provide support to the persons who are admitted within the hospital. And we would of course like persons to cooperate with us, to, with our security, with our staff. And please try to understand that it's a means of trying to protect our patients who are within hospital, who are free from the virus. And you know, we don't want them to, to get infected by a visitor. There are areas within the hospital that we will require that persons get tested before entering, of course, the high-risk areas. So particularly for the pediatric departments, our ICUs. So bear with us again. Try not to get upset when we request that, you know, you, you get tested before entering the wards. Again, it's a means of trying to ensure that we contain this virus and are spread within our hospital services. We also want to, to say to, to persons out there that if you're having mild illness, you're not having moderate illness or severe illness, not having shortness of breath, and you're ill, you can visit our your nearest clinic. So rather than come into the accident and emergency, you can go to the nearest clinic. And all of the clinics are open and they're doing testing and they're seeing um, all of the patients. So we're trying, of course, to make maximum use of our casualty, of course, where, where it's really needed. So that persons with mild illness who can be seen in our clinics, they can be seen there. And of course, the accident and emergency can focus more on the severe cases or persons who really need urgent care. So we just want to get a little support from our public with regards to these things. Our clinics. Now we have made some changes to our clinics. So what we've done is that we've cut down our clinics to uh, approximately 10 persons to each clinic. Now what has happened as a result of this is that persons who come for routine care would get pushed back a little and the persons who need to be seen urgently based on the underlying condition that they have, these persons will be seen. So again, we're just seeking your cooperation so that if of course you did not get called in for clinic but you need to be seen, then just call the medical records department so that they can have you sorted out and have you um, seen by the respective specialist. In terms of our operating theater, so we've had to of course suspend temporarily um, elective cases and that again is because we have, of course, shortest, shortness of staff. You know, the, our staff has becoming ill and it has become a bit difficult for us to run our regular schedule. So for this moment, at this present time, we're doing urgent cases. So when we say urgent cases, we speak about, you know, cases like different types of tumors, cancers, we, these cases we will give priority to. And of course, all the emergencies. And as soon as things settle and more staff have recovered and returned to work, will now recommence the regular schedule. So I know some persons may have had um, appointment dates for surgery. We'd just like, us, like you to bear with us. 
of course if you're having any complications or if you need to be seen before the time of course feel free to come in and we'll arrange for the specialist to see you or you could call the medical records department so these are some of the changes that has taken place at the level of hospital services that we just want to let the public know about and to ask for your cooperation during this difficult time um, we have also been doing testing PCR and antigen testing seven days a week and at our lab and we generally test between 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. so again persons can pay online or they can pay on arrival so testing is every day because I know some persons weren't sure and some persons have been calling in to ask so just please take note that we're testing seven days a week antigen testing and PCR testing 8 to 10 a.m. at the general hospital so these are some of the things happening at hospital services again I just want to implore that we really would like the cooperation of the public just to give us support during this difficult time and as soon as we have our staff back on track then we'll be able to go back to services as before and again you know COVID-19 is here it's here for a while now and of course we expect that it will be here for a bit longer we I mean we all wish and hope that this pandemic will end but of course we are still here with us so I think we all have to try to think of a new strategy a new mindset you know how do we actually live in the midst of this pandemic how do we live how do we live with it because it's not going so we would have to kind of make some adjustments in terms of how do we adapt to living during these times and again just to support some of the things that dr charles said you know of course following our protocols mandatory wearing of our face mask and not wearing it but wearing it properly making sure that we sanitize properly and of course trying to avoid large crowds and you won't believe the the i mean the benefit of wearing a mask just wearing a mask properly can really help to spread this disease and of course at level of hospital services we're seeing a lot of persons coming in with um, chronic illness and we just want to advocate for healthy living persons need to really care for themselves exercise proper diet make sure you stay hydrated all right these are things to you know ensure that you boost your immunity ensure that if you have a chronic illness that you have steady follow-up with your physician so not just see the doctor when you're ill or when something is wrong but have steady follow-ups so based on your condition your doctor will advise and you should really try to be compliant with your follow-up because having a chronic disease is not a death sentence it's actually something that if you learn to live with it you will do well and you would live a long stable life but of course if you don't then you tend to have a lot of complications and do a lot of hospital time so we just want to remind persons with the chronic illness please care for yourself follow up take your medication I know in Grenada we have the the thing about um, a little sugar and a little pressure there's nothing little about it it's a big deal all right and of course these persons are the ones who are at risk for developing severe COVID-19 disease so let us try to do follow-up let us try to be compliant with our meds and of course let us try to follow the protocols so we could prevent um, getting this virus and getting severe disease and then to the persons who do not have chronic illness you still have to care for yourself so what you need to do would be have at least every six months have your checkup because sometimes you may think that you're well but you may actually have some underlying condition that you were not aware of so you should also try to practice healthy living by doing regular checks so again the message is healthy living caring for yourselves following our protocols and most importantly based on what we've seen with the data and the data has been consistent and it's not just Grenada's data it's been the data all over the world that vaccinations have helped prevent severe illness and hospitalizations so we want to implore the, with the public please um, let's try and get vaccinated let's try to decrease our hospitalizations and let's try to see how we can curb this pandemic within our Grenada, Karakou and Piti Martinique. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Taisha Dono and, of course, Dr. Sean Charles. Colleagues, you've heard from both of them. Uh, GBN, good morning. You're ready with your questions? Yes, good morning, Rina Thomas, GBN. I have two questions for um, Dr. Charles, Chief Medical Officer, Sean Charles, and one question for the female Dr. Charles. Um, so let me go first to um, the female Dr. Charles. Can you tell us uh, the, death this, the death for this year, if it's uh, more to the Omicron or the Delta variant? And can you also explain the same for persons who are presently hospitalized? For Chief Medical Officer, UNICEF and USAID did a survey on vaccine hesitancy in the Caribbean and shared the findings last Friday with health officials including in various countries, including Grenada, so how will the Ministry of Health here use the findings to curb the, the issue of vaccine hesitancy in Grenada? And the second question for you, um, Dr. Sean Charles, is with the removal of the routine testing to targeting testing, are we not leaving room for cracks in the system, understanding that Port Authority officials will not be able to identify asymptomatic individuals coming in? Right, so let me let me um, tackle my part of the questions first. Well, I think I can <laughs> basically speak on, on on all of them. All right, uh, with regards with regards to the deaths, all right, we do not have we do not yet have um, sequencing results for three of the of the individuals. The first we attempted sequencing, but the the uh, the sequencer could not uh, read which variant um, because of something called insufficient coverage. All right, meaning that the the level of, of, of viruses in the sample um, probably were not sufficient to get a reading on the um, you know which variant it, it was. So that that is the um, that is the information I have with regards to those deaths. But please bear in mind that we had community spread of Delta since August. The last case of Delta uh, that we identified in Grenada was in December 2021. So it was last month. So we believe that Delta is still circulating. All right. We do not believe that Omicron has pushed the Delta out of uh, out of Grenada um, as yet. All right. So we should all assume that we have both Delta and Omicron circulating in Grenada. With regards to the to the survey, uh, the results were the results were interesting because I think we were. Um, we were dubbed as the second least vaccine hesitant, which should be a serious cause for concern because we, we all understand the level of vaccine hesitancy that is present in Grenada. What it shows to us is that this situation is not unique to us. All right? It is something that is present uh, throughout the region. and. Um, especially we have the evidence that at least in the countries that were surveyed, um, we are all experiencing um, huge challenges with regards to vaccine hesitancy. Uh, how, we use the, how we will use the information? Well, certainly it informs our decision on how to approach uh, the issue of vaccine hesitancy. We need to provide more avenues for persons to be educated. We noted that in the survey, um, persons who spoke to their healthcare provider um, were more inclined to get vaccinated. Uh, the Ministry of Health has been doing its part to, you know, put out information there and educate um, persons. But we do know that the level of acceptance of that message uh, has not has not been the best. So I think. And, and given the, the, the findings of this survey, I think this is an opportunity for the wider uh, Grenadian healthcare community, um, all our physicians, 
whether in the private or in the public sector, to recognize that their opinion as it relates to vaccination was important for the individuals surveyed. And many individuals, after speaking to their physicians, uh, you know, they, they, they made the decision to be in favor of vaccination or not. So what we would want to do is speak to these physicians and say, listen, try to set aside a moment in your encounters with each patient and have a discussion with them with regards to vaccination. All right, you are able to, to analyze the, the evidence with regards to the effectiveness of vaccination, and you will be able to calm the concerns all right, uh, in the minds of, uh, of your patients. So we particularly took note of that, and that is one of, one of the first um, steps. We want to encourage um, our healthcare providers. You still have some sway in the minds of, uh, of patients, and I, uh, we believe that you can, you can assist us greatly in ensuring that you know persons um, make the decision to get vaccinated. But of course, the other findings that are, that are there are really targets for us to uh, use in our ongoing education campaign. Right, with regards to persons coming in and the testing and so on, no system is perfect, huh? um, no system is perfect. And yes, your observation is, is correct. Um, it means that an asymptomatic person may come in, all right? Even with testing, an asymptomatic person um, can come in because it depends on the stage of infection that, um, that we are at. But what we want persons to understand is that the infection is spreading from person to person in the community. This is where the largest proportion of infections are coming from. Um, we presented that less than 1%, and it's far less than 1% of the tests done at the ports of entry were positive, all right? In some instances, less than 0.5 percent so what this what this demonstrates is that listen every day we report on number of positives number of positives number of positives this is from our communities this is not from the airport it's from our communities this is where the disease is spreading and this is where the ministry of health wants to focus its resources all right, we want to focus the resource on where the risk is and where the transmission is. And we don't want persons to get distracted with um, the ports of entry. We will continue our health screens at ports of entry and we will continue targeted testing. But what we want is for persons to understand that, listen, is the community is where the problem, problem lies and this is where we need to give the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nancy Maguire, good morning. Nancy, good morning. Are you there? Yes, good morning. Um, last week, I had asked uh, for the, um, a number or a percentage of the healthcare workers that are off sick. I followed up, uh, Dr. Sean had said he would provide those. I'm wondering if this week uh, we could get any numbers. And secondly, I recall in November when um, Honorable Wilson became the chair of the subcommittee, he had said we need more aggressive, more hand-to-hand -hand kind of comment to combat against this disease. So how does that uh, line up with the recommendations from this survey? Thank you. All right, so with regards to the percentage of healthcare workers, unfortunately, I do not have. Maybe Dr. Donald may have information on, uh, from hospital level. We do know we have uh, some healthcare workers who have, um, who, are, who became infected 
and some have recovered some are are still at home um, you know um, in in isolation uh, the exact percentage I I do not have unfortunately um, I believe the, 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 the question is how does the recommendations or the findings of this study Well, the thing is, I believe overall we need a more aggressive education campaign. All right. However, like I say, one of the observations in the study um, that 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 I can point out was the fact that uh, person's decision to get vaccinated, uh, you know, it. After speaking to the healthcare, uh, healthcare provider, they were more inclined. And I, I, and you know, in my previous answer, I pointed out that listen, this is an important avenue here, because you know we have been here weekly, you know, trying to convince the public to get vaccinated. Um, we have um, some messages out there in the media that are playing some um, public service announcements. But we know that a, a, a large section of the population is not receptive of the message that is coming from the Ministry of Health or that is coming from the government of Grenada for whatever reason. All right, so, you know, we would really like to, in addition, at least engage or encourage our healthcare providers to assist us here all right because they might be able to take those persons you know that extra mile and convince them to get get vaccinated so that is where i see um you know the findings lining up more or less with um what our you know approach is thanks uh, with regards to the number of uh, healthcare professionals infected at the level of hospital services, uh, the last um, report we had it was about, uh, in terms of, I could give you numbers. It was 32 nurses affected, and we have 16 physicians um, with COVID 19, along with auxiliary staff, which I couldn't give you the exact number. So 32 nurses and 16 physicians within hospital services. Thank you. That's very. May I carry on? Yes, go ahead, Nancy. Thank you very much for those numbers. Um, so that's 32 nurses out of how many? And 16 physicians out of how many? And another question about the survey they had suggested that I use non government people and local influencers. Do you have any um, idea where you're going to go with that recommendation as to where you're going to find these influencers? Thank you. Well, your question is, I, I, um, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Because we have recognized this for some time. All right, we have recognized this for some time. It's been two years. It's been two years since we are facing this national health emergency. And the short answer to your question is, I am not sure. I am not sure where we're going to find these influencers because if after two years and all of the impact that this pandemic has had on the country, we do not have you know, some patriotic patriotic individuals or patriotic influencers who will step forth and, you know, you know, lend us a helping hand. Um, I am not sure. Um, that, that, is, that is the question. I do not know um, how uh, or, or where we're going to find these, these individuals. Um, but I still hold out the hope that Maybe with this survey and maybe some of the persons who are influential out there in the population, maybe it will assist us in convincing them that, listen, the external um, organization that did the survey recognizes that there is a role for 
influential people to participate in the COVID response. All right, uh, maybe uh, this will assist in convincing some of some of them to assist us. I'm, I am I am not sure. So the answer to the question really is, I am not sure what more it will take to have some of the influential people come out there and step forward and you know um, you know put their hands to the wheel with us to assist us as we navigate this this um, this pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Is that it from you? Anybody else with questions, colleagues? Uh, uh, Dr. Charles, maybe you can just give a brief update on what what is being done right now, uh, what measures in place, just to monitor the school system to ensure that there's not much spread, at least we minimize it as much as possible. Right, so I, I, I know that when the decision was taken to, to, um, to open schools, uh, there was, you know, a, a great bit of concern, and I, I think a lot of the concern um, came out of um, maybe the understanding, the understanding of, of the pandemic or, or the, 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 the stage of the pandemic, you know, maybe persons didn't truly understand um, you know what the, what the situation was the thing is this is a disease that is in every community in Grenada this is a disease that is affecting almost every household in Grenada all right so it is not that it is spreading in schools and not spreading in churches all right it is not that it is spreading on the bus and not spreading in the home all right the, the, the disease is everywhere so at all times, we must adopt um, behaviors, you know, bearing in mind that the disease is everywhere. And we know that generally in, like, in the workplaces and in schools and so on, there is less of a danger of disease spread. I mean, it has been, it, 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 it has been an observation that schools have not been a source of outbreak for a community, all right? And this has been the observation. Why? Because at the schools we have protocols. At the schools we require persons to wear masks and sanitize and distance. The same in the workplace. All right? Even riding on a bus, you're expected to wear a mask. All right? You're expected to sanitize. So persons may think that these are the places where the disease is spreading. Well, the truth, in truth and in fact, if persons are adhering to the rules, to the protocols that are laid out for all of these settings, these sites are actually the safest, right? These sites are actually the safest. And what I can tell you is, where this disease spreads mostly is in the home and in those places where persons flaunt the rules. All right, so at home, like I say, we all come from different places and we converge. And I, I don't think that there are literally anyone wearing a mask around their family member, all right? So this is where the disease spreads most readily. So we knew it was safe to open schools, all right? We knew it is safe for churches to continue, all right? Because they are operating with protocols to prevent infection. Most of the infection is occurring in the home. However, there are settings outside of the home when pers where persons get infected as well. And that is because in those settings, persons are not applying the measures to, pr to, um, to protect themselves. All right, and those things do happen and persons um, do get infected. With regards to schools, yes, schools are open. You are going to get uh, the, the, the student that is going to get infected because the students, every student comes from a home. And if I just mentioned that the home is where the disease is spreading most readily, you understand the situation. So we all have to, you know, we all have to um, 
you know, do our best in order to protect, um, to protect each other. All right. So infections will will occur. All right. Infections will occur. Um, it is not something that we should get uh, overly anxious about, since we have so many layers to prevent infection and to protect from serious disease. All right. And we, we must remember that we have to coexist with this disease for a long time to come. All right, we must coexist with this disease, disease for some time to come. So that is how we should look at the entirety of the situation and not just, you know, um, zoom in on the on the on the individual details. Thank you very much, Mikey. Good morning. Good morning to you, Leslie, and good morning to Dr. Charles and uh, to Dr. Taisha Donald. I'm sorry I had to step away, and I'm back. And I have, I have two questions. Um, forgive me if it was already addressed, but how does the shortage of staff affect your operations and ability to meet the daily demands, not only um, in the general hospital, and I know Dr. Charles spoke, Dr. Um, Donald spoke about the outpatients clinic, but in terms of the outer parishes and the the health center and health clinics there how does that how is that affected and secondly i know you spoke of as well being somewhat short staff i heard that there have been prank calls coming into the er and, and ambulance services can you confirm that for us and and what is your message what do you have to say about these calls coming into the services Good morning, Mikey, and thank you for that question. And yes, I can confirm that we have had these prank calls, and you know, it's, it's, it's actually very sad that this is happening in the midst of the pandemic with the a number of cases that we have and persons seeking medical care. So I would really like to, to, to uh, you know, ask the public to work with us. Please work with us. Think of it like this. Now, if you do a prank call and there's someone, a family member, who actually needs to have that ambulance call, what would have happened is that the resources would have been deployed to an area that is not needed for an area that is actually in dire need of that service. So it means that what would happen is someone who needs urgent care would be deprived of that care because of your prank call. So yes, I can confirm that these calls have happened and you know we're really saddened by that because we're in the midst of this pandemic we're in the midst of uh, community spread we have a surge in cases and of course we would have a lot of our elderly persons who will need care and of course if an ambulance goes i mean we've had instances where an ambulance would go to our household and the persons there don't have any idea why the ambulance is there and then you have the the other instances where ambulances go out and and then no one is there. So we have the, the two scenarios. No one is there and the other scenario where the persons within the household have no idea why the ambulance is there. So I really want to ask persons um, that we should really stop that practice because it's, it's affecting our system and it's actually deploying a service to an area that it's not needed. And persons who really need that service will not get the benefit of it. And again, it goes back to your first question, your other question, which is that of how does it affect our health services? So we're in a system where we have a number of our healthcare professionals ill, so it does affect our services. So what, what, what has had to happen is that we had to crunch. So whereas persons who would have been scheduled for surgeries and so, we had to now put it off and divert to just urgent cases, urgent and emergency cases. So all the elective cases, meaning cases that are scheduled and um, it does not have, having the surgery today or tomorrow does not affect the person's well-being. Um, we had to put these cases off, right? So, and then of course it means that this person, whatever problem they're having, they, of course they have to bear with it for a little longer. And then in terms of, for example, places like the accident and emergency, and our outpatient clinic. Um, it's become very challenging because of course the wait time sometimes to access care is longer. And this is happening both at the level of community and at the level of hospital. So wait times would be increased. And so we really have to ask the public to bear with us a bit because of course, because we have less staff available, it means your wait time would be a, a bit longer. 
but of course we try to do a triad system both at level of community and at level of hospital so that the persons who need to be seen urgently are seen first and persons who can wait um, would wait a little longer so again the wait time so I know a lot of times persons really complain about waiting at our different facilities but because of our situation right now you will have a little longer wait but we try our best to give service to the persons who need it most first so we do a, a, a triad system and we do it by order of priority so yes it's been a difficult period for us it has affected our services we have longer wait times but you know we still managing to cope so we're hoping that as we progress more persons recover we will be able to reincorporate and, and and go back to our regular services as before this surge thank you <coughs> Well, in particular, uh, at, uh, well, I wanted to mention in particular the level of the community where um, the bulk of testing and so on is, 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 is occurring. The issue of staff challenges, is, is, uh, you know, shortages is, is more acute because um, the community health services, uh, they have many, many functions. You know, they do the child health, the antenatal, their are routine um, patient and consultations, there's home visits, there are many, many services that are offered to the public. When um, persons fall sick or when we simply do not have, the, you know, the adequate number of staff to cover all of these services, uh, it, it puts a lot of pressure on the remaining staff to maintain some level of service. All right, and with the huge demand for testing, I mean, it's putting a lot of strain on our community staff, and um, you know that's why we ask for understanding from the public. When you go to a testing site, and yes, there's a long line. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a reason for this. If we had, if we had, uh, you know, a, a, a large complement of staff, of course, yeah, that, that line may not be so long. But you need to understand that we are working on the you know, a bit of pressure right now. And, um, you know, we, we, we recognize and we applaud the staff who remain for the amount of work that they are able to put in because the number of tests that we are doing right now is, you know, far exceeds anything that we have done in the past in such a, in such a short time. So, yeah, it is putting, it is putting um, you know, tremendous strain on everyone. We just hope that, you know, we, that everyone can hold on uh, at least until we get past, you know, this 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 surge. Thank you very much, Mikey. Nisha Paul. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Charles, can you provide an update as it relates to the infection rate among persons of school aged, and if possible, the infection rate among teachers? And can you also? Um, speak to how many schools have been affected uh, by, the, by the infections, um, whether it be amongst the teachers or other staff and students. Thank you. All right, so what I can tell you, I cannot give you a breakdown um, by schools or teachers because remember what I said, that this is a disease that spreads readily in the home environment so a school may have a child infected or a teacher infected but this does not mean that the school is where the disease um, was acquired all right so this must be this must be um, you know this must be taken into consideration what i can tell you up to the 11th of January persons under 18 represented 11.5 percent of cases persons between the age of 18 and 24 15 percent between the age of 25 and 49 62.5 percent let me repeat that between the age of 25 and 49 62 0.5 percent between the age of 50 and 69 8.6 percent and those over 70 2.4 percent so children 
or persons under 18 do, are not the most affected uh, group here. All right. These are persons between the ages of 25 and 49 who represent 62.5% of infection. All right. I hope I, I, I know that this is in general, but I hope that you know at least it provides some some um, insight. Now remember, if persons are taking the appropriate steps to prevent themselves from becoming infected, the rate of infection will drop. If persons are taking measures, they're getting vaccinated. They're living a healthy life. The rate of severe disease and hospitalization will drop. It all goes back to the individual and not the institution. All right? It is the individual that gets infected and not the institution. Uh, Nancy McGuire, you have a follow up question? Yes, I do. Um, I just wanted to clarify the figures that um, Dr. Donald gave was 32 nurses of, out of how many nurses and 16 physicians out of how many physicians. And just to clarify, that is for hospital services. That means all our hospitals. Thank you. Yes, it's for hospital services and I, I can't give you the total the total number. GBN, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, one follow-up question. You clearly stated, Dr. Charles, Sean Charles, that the virus is spreading readily in the home and environment. Do you still firmly believe that it is the best move to have students in the classroom, understanding that it's difficult for them to keep the mask constantly and to stay away from each other because of the social needs? All right, that's, a, that's an important question. Now, remember, when we discussed the opening of schools, we stated how necessary opening of schools are. Remember, health in this case for our, our, our students is not simply the absence of COVID. And what must be recognized is that probably for months to years from now, there will be no absence of COVID in Grenada. So health is not the absence of COVID or a level of COVID that we think is acceptable. The health of our, of, of our children is influenced tremendously by their education and the education environment is vital for the normal development of every child. Now schools don't just educate, they socialize. They offer a safe environment where some students um, can escape some of the nightmares that they are living. They offer nutrition, they offer counseling, the peer interaction is very important for the normal development of a child. Now we have postponed this for two years to the detriment of the child. The question is, when you look at the risks and the benefit, which do you choose? Do you prefer a dysfunctional, uneducated individual or do you prefer the opposite? Now, it has been demonstrated that across all of the variants of COVID-19, um, children are the least severely affected. All right, they are the least. Most um, children who become infected with COVID have a mild disease that they are able to shake. 
the majority of persons that have suffered severe complications from COVID have been persons who were elderly, especially those over 60, over 65, and persons with comorbidities, underlying health problems like diabetes and, 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 and all of those. So when you put all of those factors together, there isn't, we do, uh, there isn't a justification to further keep our schools closed. There simply isn't. Now, we are not saying that a child may not get COVID, and I have spoken before that in the majority of cases, the child picked up the COVID at home from a parent or from you know a relative or so, as in, in the majority of cases. All right, we are not saying that a child may not be affected by COVID or a teacher may not be affected by COVID. We are saying when you balance all of these factors, I mean, it is unconscionable to keep children at home further. And the other question is, for how long? I simply have not heard a plausible justification to keep our children home further. Because individuals who are concerned about their personal safety can get vaccinated. They have the choice of getting vaccinated. All right. We have vaccines for all persons 12 years and over. It is a, it is a choice that persons can exercise to further um, protect themselves. And we have protocols. We require the wearing of masks. We require distancing and sanitizing and all of that so that infection is preventing, is, is prevented. Like I say, we have protocols in schools to avoid infection, but these do not exist at home. So the schools continue to be a safe environment for children to be in. I hope that um, further clarifies the, the, um, the matter. All right, colleagues, we're getting ready to wrap up. Anybody with a final question? Okay, so we will wrap things up now. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Donnell. Final words from you, and then I'll go to Dr. Sean Charles. Okay, thank you. I would just like to say that, um, you know, we're in the midst of the pandemic. It's, it's, it's over two years. And of course, we really don't know how long this pandemic will be on for. So we would just like to, you know, encourage persons to let us all learn how to live in the context of this pandemic. Let us try to do healthy living, follow our protocols, wear our masks properly, avoid crowds, um, sanitization of your, your areas, your hands. And of course, um, and let us all encourage each and every one of us, our friends, our families, let us encourage each other to get vaccinated. Um, because based on the data that's documented, not just in Grenada, but in, in all other countries, persons who are vaccinated are less likely to develop severe COVID-19 disease and are less likely to be hospitalized. So we just want to implore persons, let us learn to live in the midst of pandemic. Let us see what our new norm would be. Let us follow our protocols and let us all try to get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Donald. Dr. Sean Charles, final words from you. Um, in closing, I would just like to recognize all our hardworking healthcare staff who are out there in the, in the field today, um, or nurses or doctors or you know, persons working at a lab, all our auxiliary staff, everyone. I know that we are all under tremendous pressure right now with with this wave, and you know the demands are the demands are great. We just want to say, hold on. Um, you know this. Uh, you know they say nothing lasts forever. All right. So even bad times don't last forever. All right. We are going to get through this. We recognize the tremendous amount of work that is going in. We, we recognize the astronomical number of tests that you are doing each day. Um, sometimes we don't even understand how you are doing it. Um, we just know that you, you, know, you are doing an amazing job out there. So we want to recognize you and we want to say thanks. Um, for the public, all we ask for is your understanding 
and we ask for persons to make you know the best decision the most responsible decision to protect yourself and to protect your family follow the protocols get vaccinated you know and let's all live with covid we will continue to do our best to protect you and to, and, and to give you the best advice that we can to protect yourself um, but the rest is up to you all right this is about personal responsibility and this is about us living you know and thriving with you know with and despite covid thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Sean Charles, Acting Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Taisha Donnell, Acting Director of Medical Services, and of course, colleagues, thank you so much to all of you who joined us via Zoom this morning, as well as the viewers who joined us on Channel 22 of Facebook page, YouTube channel, and of course, GBN as well. So good morning to all of you as well. As we've heard, we just need to continue to follow the protocols. What more can we say at this point that you do not know? It's been at least two years or so now we've been dealing with COVID-19, different variants, but it's the same thing that we need to do to ensure that we protect ourselves as much as possible and as mentioned the routine testing will now take place in the communities because we want to ensure that we minimize community spread there's only so much we can do but you have to at least exercise your personal responsibility as well to ensure that you keep yourself safe your colleagues and of course your family members for those of you who are making these calls and calling out the medical professionals to go to places where there are no cases I'm not sure what you're thinking what is going through your head when you're doing something something like this. We're supposed to be working as a team, the entire country, and helping the medical professionals because we know they're under a lot of pressure. They are also getting ill because they are humans as well. Why on earth would we call out people to places where there are no cases is beyond me. We need to be more responsible, please. All right, so here's where we end for today. I'm Leslie Ann Johnson. Thank you so much for viewing. We'll see you again next week.